routine of entering the prison grounds is always a grueling process. Body checks, metal detectors, inpatient guards. Finally, after long delays, I follow a guard through a gate out into an open yard where we meet up with a bunch of inmates standing in front of an empty building. The men nod as the guard opens up the gate and takes us to a room inside. I register that we are the only ones in the building. And before I know it, I hear the guard say, good luck, as he walks out of the building and locks the gate behind him. That sound of the gate locking rings in my ears. And then while the other men are setting up, one of the inmates approaches me. My name's Sam, and gives me the rundown about how he's been leading the group before me. He then says, that's my seat over there, pointing to a chair at the front of the room. You could sit over there. And over there is back with the rest of the chairs where the other men will sit. Now, Sam knows that I've been invited by the prison to lead and teach the group meditation, and that this is most likely not how I would have organized the space. He's clearly establishing himself as the alpha. I feel all the men's eyes on me. My fight, flight, freeze response is fully activated. And I know that the choice that I'm about to make will determine the success or failure of my future work with these men. So what do I do? Do I get up in Sam's face and say, I decide where I sit? Yeah, I don't think that would go over very well. <laughs> or I guess I do what I've done so often in the past, which is back down, be nice, and say something like, oh, okay, Sam, no worries. I'll sit over here. But wait, does that really solve the problem? How can I effectively teach and gain the men's trust if Sam's calling all the shots? Come on, Joe. There's got to be other options. Okay, here we go. Hey guys, before we get started, I just want to say how excited I am to be working with you, and I really appreciate your dedication to learning and self-development. And Sam, I'm grateful to you for being such an important force with this group. Okay, that seems to lower the tension a bit. Now, I'm really looking forward to sharing these meditation techniques with you in the same way that I learned them from my teachers in order to give you the most authentic experience. And I look Sam in the eyes. Are you open to trying that? OK. Well, in that case, I'd like to slightly rearrange how we're sitting. They agree. Great. OK, so everyone grab a cushion or a chair, and let's sit in a circle. Now, I purposely choose a spot that's 90 degrees from Sam's chair in order to pivot away from that point of tension. And then I say to the group, I'd like to save the spot next to me for Sam. We all look at Sam, and we fully exhale, take our seats, and get started. That first class I taught was so beautiful, and I owe it all to the choices I made in that critical moment. I didn't start a fight, but more importantly, I didn't do what many of us have been taught to do, always be nice and give in. You know, don't rock the boat. Keep the peace. Always be polite and courteous, even at our own expense. I call this default survival mechanism chronic niceness. And chronic niceness has to stop. My whole life, I have seen firsthand the tragic ways in which violence and bullying has caused so much pain and suffering to so many. From growing up in Queens, New York, trying to survive a volatile, sometimes violent childhood, to my decades of work and study around the world in the fields of conflict prevention and strategic communication. And at the same time, I have also seen the damaging effects when people are always nice, chronically nice, in situations that demand something more courageous, assertive, or truthful. What does that look like? Have you agreed to take on more work knowing that you're on the brink of burning out? Yeah, that's chronic niceness. 
Are you watching your family or friends suffer from alcohol or fentanyl addiction and not doing or saying anything about it? Chronic niceness. Do you listen to your colleagues or, or family marginalize someone, make false statements about them, and not speak up? Chronic niceness. Oh, and how many times a day do you say, I'm sorry, when you really haven't done anything wrong? Yep, chronic niceness. Everything may seem fine on the surface, but these examples, they cause confusion. They erode trust and, and threaten safety. They even damage our relationships, and more importantly, they cause harm to ourselves. In the early 1960s, when the war world was on the brink of nuclear war, the United States First Lady and UN Ambassador Eleanor Roosevelt said, we have to face the fact that either all of us are going to die together or we are going to learn to live together. And if we are to live together, we have to talk. In other words, we have to be civil with each other. But here we are, more than 60 years later, How's that going? We still haven't figured out how to talk. The level of polarization on our rhetoric is off the charts in social media, in the news, and not only with strangers, but also with family and friends. And we can't just blame this on the bullying and the assertive talk. It's also a result of chronic niceness. And not addressing chronic niceness perpetuates patterns of conflict and derails the possible emergence of solutions that are so desperately needed. So here's the dilemma we face. How can we be civil and not be chronically nice? If we don't want to be chronically nice, what do we do instead? Iconic American author James Baldwin said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. So if we want to learn to live together, then we have to face our challenges, as Baldwin suggests. And in order to do that effectively, we have to cure our chronic niceness and replace it with something more skillful and courageous. And the cure for chronic niceness is fierce civility. Fierce civility is an upgraded way of communicating that is both civil and fierce where the ultimate goal is to bridge our differences and turn potential conflicts into collaborative problem solving. The tools, skills, and strategies of fear civility help us to increase our capacity to stand up for ourselves safely and also take care of the other in challenging situations. How does this work? Okay. Let's go back to that critical moment with Sam, and I'm going to show you how I used a combination of tools from fear civility uh, to turn a potential conflict into an outcome that worked for us all. The room is silent. We're staring at the chair. In those first few seconds, I recognize that I am in a fight, flight, free survival response, so I implement the first tool, regulate the nervous system. I use subtle breath and concentration techniques to get calmer and to open all my senses so that I can make more solution-oriented choices. Second, by meeting the others where they are, I use compassion and curiosity to remember that Sam has more at stake with these men than I do. Therefore, I don't want to shame Sam in the eyes of his peers, so I commit to disarming Sam's strategy without disempowering him. Third, I create a space of safety and trust for, my, for, for all of us, including myself, by complimenting their accomplishments and, and showing my excitement to teach. And this leads to the fourth tool, when I help them to get, get less reactive and be open to something more receptive, creating the conditions for collaborative buy-in. What are the results? I get to claim my authority as the teacher, while Sam also feels respected and valued. Win-win. Now let's be clear, it took a lot of practice for me to be able to let go of my own chronic niceness and get to a fiercely civil response like this one. And it was so worth it, because what started out as a power struggle ended up with us eventually becoming like brothers, sharing a lot of laughter, 
heartache and mutual growth. And the same can happen for you. And if there was ever a time when the world needed more of us to step up and face our challenges with fierce civility, it's now. According to the United Nations 2021 annual report, we are at an important inflection point in history. The world is experiencing its biggest shared test since the Second World War. Humanity faces a stark and urgent choice. Break down and a future of perpetual crises or break through to a better, more sustainable, peaceful future. Yes, the world does feel out of control. And I still have hope. I can see that better, more sustainable future emerging where we can learn to live together. But first, chronic niceness has to stop. It starts with every one of us right here, right now, making the decision that every time we feel we're about to get stuck being chronically nice, that we use these four tools instead. Regulate the nervous system, meet the others where they are, create safety and trust, get collaborative buy-in. Because when more of us do that and we become fiercely civil, we will find collaborative ways to prevent that global breakdown and work together to make that global breakthrough a reality. One chair at a time. Thank you. Thank you.